Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for returning to day two of the November 2022 Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission meeting in Gateway, Colorado. Um, we're going to start straight up uh, with roll call. So Laura, if you'll do that. Adams. Present. Bailey. Here. Fleka. Here. Haskett. Here. May. Present. Otero is absent. Phillips. Here. Reading. Here. Touchton. Here. Marty. Present. Chair Hauser. Yes, here. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for a great packed day yesterday and um, for all of the work and time the commission uh, put in and will put in um, over the next six months or so. So eat your Wheaties. Um, it's going to be it's going to be fun. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, we're going to start right away um, with item number 23, Justin Rudder. This is typically on our first day. Um, and I want to thank GoCo2 for adjusting um, to today as well, um, given our uh, agenda yesterday. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the commission, direct, assistant direct, uh, acting director, <laughs> Dugan. My name is Justin Rudder. I am the assistant director for financial and capital services. And today I'm presenting to you with a financial update. So included in your mailing packet, uh, the presentation today is fairly short, but the mailing packet does include additional information. I'm just sharing the first slide off of the uh, sources and uses report, which is reporting quarter one results or results from July 1st to September 30th for this year. Also included is the 23-24 capital list, which we touched on yesterday, which is our request that's in front of the legislature currently for capital development projects. So this is the slide I was referencing. It's actually most of the slides today are just a big block of numbers. Um, hopefully you can see them better on your devices. But this is the all parks and wildlife funds combined. This is the total financial results for this first quarter. Uh, <clears throat> So if, in the top section there, we have revenues, and you can see kind of at the bottom right-ish under difference, our revenues are down year over year approximately $4 million. This is due to uh, a few changes in revenue, but going in opposite directions. General fund and severance tax are down $9 million. That's due to one-time transfers that were made by the General Assembly to our funds last year that did not reoccur this year. However, our revenue from operations is up $2 million. Other sources, including grants, which are typically reimbursement basis, are up $3 million, which gives us that net $4 million. Moving to the bottom half of the slide, we see expenses are up approximately $9 million. We've talked a lot about uh, increasing budgets and increasing activity, and we're starting to see that reflected in the numbers. Uh, personal services and operating are a chunk of the increase. Uh, approximately $6 million of that 9.6 is from operations. Uh, if you look at the capital expenditure section in the, the bottom half of the expenditure section, where it looks like it's down, but if you exclude capital acquisitions, which are property deals primarily, which are variable in timing, it's more or less flat in capital. However, between the two of those, our net position changed $13 million. So with $9 million more expenses and $4 million less revenue, our total change in financial position was down $13 million. From here, I'm going to move on to the capital side. If there's any questions on finance, I could take them now, or we could take them at the end. Right. So, I did want to provide a capital development update. This is a very busy program, and we're getting busier. So, this is each of these columns is a different fiscal year of funding. Uh, the Greenish, it's a lot of green. The two bottom greens are the kind of main capital program with the smaller programs kind of up top. And the most current year, since we haven't set the budgets for next upcoming year, the small programs, those are not showing. But you can see that we've had variable rate levels of funding, and this year kind of dwarfs what we've done in the past. This is more capital than I believe we've ever done. Total request is about $100 million there. And just for an idea of the program, this is showing by number of projects. So this is not related to dollar figures, but just individual projects as they're enumerated in our system. We are working on approximately 1,770 projects currently. Of those, uh, 
we've got the number 1,200 of those are small cap, which is the big gray on the right, which is $5,000 to $150,000. That's a lot of, like a vault toilet would fall in there, a fence would fall in there. That's, that's a lot of the, what we actually do, but it's not the big dollars. There are approximately 180 of those large capital projects that are $150,000 or more. One clarification. Commissioner Adams, Sorry. thank you. Um, just, is there a threshold, um, a, a numeric or a threshold around what uh, small versus big? Like, you know, is there an actual number or? Yeah. So, thank you for the question, Commissioner Adams. So, it, it's internally defined. It's unique to CPW. So, under five thousand dollars, those are considered operating expenses. So, those would just come out of individual cost centers budgets. From five thousand to one hundred fifty thousand dollars, those are considered small cap. And we set, as a leadership team, we set an allocation at the beginning of the year for the regions, and then the region manages those budgets. Above that amount, each individual project is a leadership team decision, $150,000 or more. And those are tracked as individual projects and come out of a separate funding source. Welcome. So this is the capital list, and like I said, it's another big block of numbers, but these are the approved uh, projects going into the next fiscal year. The they're organized first by region, and then uh, parks versus wildlife, and then dams being its own section, aquatic terrestrial and natural resources being its own section, and central projects. As I mentioned, there's approximately $100 million on the list of this total amount. Approximately $50 million is related to three office projects. We are looking to replace the Fort Collins Service Center. We are looking to create a joint training center at the 6060 Broadway complex, and we're looking to replace the Durango office. So those three projects represent a large chunk of the funding. Uh, projects on this list are from 200,000 to $31 million in scope. Uh, I do wanna point out that on this list is funding for the replacement of the North Sterling Visitor Center. We have completed planning for that project and are ready to build construction. So we will be, re be replacing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but more, there's also a number of dams on this list. There's a number of replacement projects. It's, it's, it runs the gamut of the activities that we do. Uh, the last slide was included, which I mentioned verbally, just to help decipher the list with parks projects in green and white, wildlife projects in blue and white, and so forth. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Okay, questions from the commission? Comments? Commissioner Touchton. Uh, I, I almost touched the thing. <laughs> <laughs> I must be one of the violators. I can, I can tell by how you breathe. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Justin, uh, the, uh, yesterday and uh, in, in several written comments on the license allocation issue, um, multiple people have made this comment that we're sitting on $52 million. Uh, I don't know where that, I, I didn't find that number, but I, and so, um, and, and the implication being that um, we should take some of our $52 million and uh, subsidize resident hunters at the, at the detriment of non-resident hunters. And I just wanted to ask, like, do we have a pot of pirate gold or, or is it allocated to other uh, activities? Thank you for the question, Commissioner. Uh, so I, I, I don't know of any pirate gold. I think it's, it's all in the closet, money closet where I keep all the cash. Um, uh, so I think the $52 million likely comes from that same slide, the all fund sources, sources and uses report from last year, kind of an end of year totalation or maybe even two years ago. Um, one thing to know about that 52 million, it's not all one source. So if we got $10 million general fund transferred in, that would show us $10 million in that kind of overall. Um, but there is a substantial amount of wildlife cash in particular that is sitting in fund balance. Uh, I think our current cash fund report shows about 150 million, so more than anticipated. Uh, however, that as you mentioned, that that was allocated. That's the, the list that I just showed you, the $100 million of capital, that's why we raise fees. Those projects have been deferred for some time, and we've been building cash balance and now we're, and we're expending it. If all that money were to go out the door at the same time, I'd probably be in trouble, because it's, it's slightly more than we have cash on hand. We couldn't pay for every project right now, but we're anticipating construction projects to take time. And I guess lastly, I'd just note that we, 
we didn't raise fees to lower fees. We, we raised fees to increase revenue so we could do more. Um, it wasn't intended to offset one group's cost or another. Commissioner Adams and then Commissioner Blecka. Thank you. Um, can you speak to item number 18? I, I, I had to look at it several times just to see, is this $31 million? Am I reading this accurately? You are, uh, and that's, uh, it's up from the original planning estimate, but it's $31 million. So that the, that's the Fort Collins Service Center replacement. So we currently have an office on Prospect Road, kind of right across the stadium, or across the road from the stadium. There's approximately eight parking spots in front. There, we're gonna lose half of those to road expansion. So we're gonna have about four parking spots for customers. Uh, the building is actually two or three buildings that's been connected by various hallways. The utilities, such as uh, upgraded internet, are all run through conduits that are hanging in the hallways, kind of up in the corners. Our world-class aquatic health lab is in the uh, basement break room with a necropathy, necropathy, I probably said that wrong still, mm -hmm. table at the workstation. It's, it's the result of years of making do. Um, however, we do own a nice piece of property that we refer to as the bird farm. Uh, probably couldn't come up with a better name, but it's uh, <laughs> right on I-25 just north of Fort Collins. And so the, the plan there is to redevelop that into a service center where customers can come. Uh, eventually we're looking at shooting ranges and storage, all that. It's gonna be the North Colorado Center for coming into the state and meetings with the CPW. Um, it's also a bit out of town, so utility costs are a bit high. We won't be able to move the, the water lab immediately because of the water needs and the kind of treatment needs we need. So it's most of the project at 31 million, but it's not the entire project. It will be more expensive at the end of the day, but it is a substantial investment of our resources. Thank you very much. And I just, um, you know, the more that we can tell that story to the public to, and, and have photos of not only this, but of course my favorite image it's going away. The mold on the ceiling. <laughs> so, I mean, because again, you know, when you're like, what is this? But then you see, you're like, oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And even this, it's like, oh, there's wires hanging. Oh, okay. So again, <laughs> just, that was a huge price point. So thank you for unpacking that. We're all a little punchy this morning. <laughs> I'm going to go, uh, uh, Commissioner Blecka, if it's okay, I'll go to Commissioner May and then come to Commissioner Blecka. Commissioner May. Thank you, Madam Chair. Justin, in reference to the question I had yesterday, thanks for all the answers. I hadn't got into this, so I wasn't aware yesterday, but I wondered on our projects for the repair and maintenance of dams, are any of those under a compliance order from the state to where we're required to complete those in a certain time frame? Thank you for the question. Off the top of my head, I don't think any of the dams we have are currently under restriction. There might be a small dam in the southwest that I can't remember the name of that um, is a, essentially a fishing pond that we're looking at how to correct, but I don't think that's necessarily under restriction. It's just the highest priority I can think of as far as uh, problems. But no, I do not believe any of the dams that we're working on are currently under restriction. Thanks, Justin. That was my question. If we had a different tier of priorities on how some of these projects should be completed. Commissioner May, do you have water on your mind? Just curious. Uh, usually. <laughs> <laughs> Except for when there's too much, right? Yeah, the, that uh, hasn't happened. <laughs> yeah, Commissioner Blecka. Thank you. Um, I just had a comment, and it was kind of dovetailing off of some of the other things. Um, uh, the public comment around uh, what Commissioner Tushin had said, you know, people commenting on oh, you were sitting on all this money. But I just wanted to say that, like, even though we're, we're doing all of these things, like these huge lifts, there is still a lot of work going on. Like, we're putting that money back into our agency, into our facilities, into the things that people are using. So when you see these fees or whatever, it's going back into what we're, our mission and what we're doing. And thank you for the visitor center <laughs> in North Sterling. David Piper's me so psyched. <laughs> but anyway, but, but, but in all sincerity, I'm being serious. Um, it, it is a big deal. So thank you for all of your hard work at that. Seeing is believing, is it not? If I could just respond real yes, quick. Yes, go ahead, Justin. I sure. appreciate yeah, that. And I think it's why I struggle sometimes when talking about finances. I say, you know, adding money to fund balance or 
change in that position. I, we don't profit. We're not trying to. We're not trying to build money or pay back shareholders. Or we're we're saving up money to go do more of the mission. And uh, in many cases, attend to deferred maintenance. So uh, a lot of that has built up over time. Any other questions for Justin? While we have him on the hot seat. Okay, I think you're off the hook, Justin. Thank you very much. Okay, we will move directly into item number 24, which is our GoCo update. Um, so Dan, come on up. Katie's here too, so. Okay, good morning, commissioners, Madam Chair, Director Dugan, Assistant Director Horgan. My name's Dan Zimmer, and I serve as Parks and Wildlife Partnership Manager for Great Outdoors Colorado. Um, purpose of my presentation today is to provide an overview of our recently completed fiscal year. We're working on finalizing our annual report and wanted to share some highlights from that. And then as soon as we finish that report, I'll be happy to bring in hard copies for all of you. Um, before we get started, though, I did want to thank uh, Region Manager Travis Black and his team. Uh, the GOCO CPW partnership team spent a week up in the Northwest region last month, and they were very gracious with their time and hosting us, and we really enjoyed the conversations with the staff, learning about the challenges and, and opportunities, and really seeing where our dollars hit the ground, so we appreciated that. Next slide, Kurt. Cool. So in the uh, recently completed fiscal year, we ran 11 grant programs on our competitive side and awarded $32 million. And then through CPW's annual investment plan, we awarded $29 million. And um, Commissioner touched in, uh, you serve on our board, so you know that is not pirate gold. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would like to call out that we are charged with investing in substantially equal amounts, and you'll see a slight variance in those numbers. Year to year, that may happen, but over the course of our five-year spending plan, for example, those numbers will meet that criteria. Um, so in the next uh, sequence of slides, I just want to highlight our, our four base programs that we run and share a little bit about those investments. We can move on. Thanks, Kurt. Um, for our community impact program, we invested $6.3 million in 10 projects in the fiscal year and wanted to highlight the project that you're looking at there that's uh, to a grant to the city of Ure, and that's the Ure Ice Park. They recently received water rights donations to ensure a, a stable water supply for the ice park, and our grant will allow them to build the infrastructure to bring that water to the park, and um, it's a huge community asset, an economic driver that'll really continue to improve the lives of the community there. Next slide. In our land acquisition program, we invested six and a half million dollars in eight projects in the fiscal year. And you're looking at an image there from uh, the Weld County. It was an investment that was a collaboration between the Trust for Public Land, the city of Greeley, and the town of Windsor. It was a one and a half million dollar investment that preserved nearly a thousand acres. And so that was the last remaining significant parcel with uh, conservation values in the area and the first uh, open space acquisition for the town of Greeley. So we're really happy to support that project. In our planning and capacity-based program, we invested a million dollars in eight, eight or nine projects um, in fiscal year 22. This one's a unique one that I wanted to highlight. It was our first grant to the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. And I just want to read a little bit about this uh, grant project. Um, it was preserving culture and enhancing habitat resilience through traditional harvest planning. Um, funding will support several activities, including an inventory and assessment of the condition of known harvest locations to identify restoration and resilience building needs. In addition, the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe will collaborate with the Montezuma Land Conservancy to explore improved access to traditional harvest uh, on private ancestral lands, and they're also going to engage with the tribe and the community to co-create a traditional harvest plan that will allow for sustainable harvest of culturally important plants for future generations. So it was a really cool project that we're happy to support. Um, moving on to our last base program at Stewardship Impact. We invested about $750,000 in three projects in the fiscal year. 
And then with stewardship being one of our closely held organizational values, we also invest a million dollars through CYCA, the Colorado Youth Corps Association, uh, to stewardship projects throughout the state. I want to talk about Generation Wild a little bit. That's an ongoing program of ours. We're pleased to continue our investments in that to the tune of $5 million for 12 coalitions throughout the state and also a significant investment for statewide communications campaign, uh, really just uh, aligning those values of equitable access and connecting youth and families to the outdoors. Um, I was pleased yesterday to take the tour of the Outdoor Wilderness Lab with you and just see the parallel goals that are going on in different areas of the state. So uh, really excited about that, and thanks to Area Manager Kirk Oldham uh, for arranging that tour and the staff at OWL. Um, so in addition to the uh, investments through CPW I mentioned at the beginning, our board also authorized up to $5 million to support the Colorado Outdoor Regional Partnerships Initiative and the associated statewide planning effort. So uh, really excited. Our dollars are starting to hit the ground uh, to support those efforts in the form of supporting new and existing regional coalitions. You can see the map of the existing 10 coalitions now. That will be growing soon as a couple more will be added in the next few weeks, I believe. Um, we're also going to be bringing on a consultant team to assist with the statewide planning components of the initiative, and, and that's happening as we speak. And then additionally, there's dollars in there for increased capacity for the regional partnerships program within CPW. So moving forward, a um, few items on our radar is we're working with Justin's team on next year's investment proposal. And then we're also uh, working with this team on the annual report for the last completed fiscal year. So at the next commission meeting, I'll be happy to zero in uh, more on the CPW investments and share that with you all. And our board will be meeting in a couple weeks on December 8th and 9th in Colorado Springs. You're certainly invited to attend or listen into that. I, I do know there's a conflict there um, with the wolf plan at the next commission meeting. Um, and then I want to wrap up with a fun video and can kick that off. Um, we did uh, set the world record for Hopscotch, we talked about last time, and I really wanted to hear uh, the Park Ranger staff at Chatfield State Park participating in that. Um, the record was a 4.37 mile course, and we spent the entire week before that at Chatfield with over 100 volunteers. Um, it was 21,871 Hopscotch squares and 215 gallons of uh, non-toxic paint and it took two and a half hours for uh three folks to complete the uh, course and i'm pretty sure it was not the park rangers that you saw there but thank you to chatfield state pack for park for hosting us they're uh, very gracious and supportive so with that i'll wrap it up and answer any questions you may have okay great awesome always fun commissioner may you've come on screen would you like to dive in or just check in um, thanks, Madam Chair. I don't think I have anything, but okay, great. one thing, since you have me, I'll go okay, ahead and take advantage yes. of it. You have the floor. Go ahead. I, I know it's just coincidence, but I always notice, and Commissioner Touchton and I talk about this once in a while in meetings, that if you go back to the maps of the, the map of the regional partnerships, take note of what's in the southeast corner of the state. I beat Commissioner Touchton to that. <laughs> he did. On that note, Commissioner Touchton. <laughs> yes, uh, well, Dallas did steal my joke, uh, but uh, yeah, we, we're under the key. And, uh, <laughs> um, but uh, I think, you know, I know you intend to, uh, to keep spreading out the, the regional partnerships. Um, but uh, I wanted to back up um, and check me if I'm wrong, but since we're here, I, and unless that it's on the consent agenda for the next um, meeting, I, I think we're funding um, the Mesa County Youth Corps, uh, you know, close to this area, if, if I'm correct, and I might have their name slightly wrong, but I, I know we're doing Youth Corps work in this area. Um, on, the, on the regional partnerships, um, I wondered if you could speak to uh, the, the Two Rivers Regional Partnership. Seems like it is in this area. I wasn't quite sure from the map, but if you could yeah. give, you know, anyone who's from while we're here, yeah. um, uh, what's going on in this area where they might engage with those regional partnerships. Yeah, yeah. thanks for those questions, Jay. Um, Katie Smith from our program team would know a little more about that stewardship, so I might invite her 
to, to come up and, and help out with that. But as far as the Two Rivers Coalition, yeah, they were funded in the last grant round that wrapped up in the summer. And that was the second time they came through. The first time they didn't make the cut. Um, they've expanded, brought on more partners, and that um, was funded through the capacity aspect. So we want to see them build up and um, hopefully they'll be ready for plan development funding in a future round. Mr. Blecka. I would just like to make the comment that still GOCO does not represent all of Colorado, whether that's intentional or not. The Northeast region, it's like blank. Mm -hmm. And I know we have a representative, <clears throat> and um, but it's a huge area that they're yeah. being given. And so when we talk about equity and we talk about doing things, it is not equitable when you don't have a representative in your area. I mean, like, look at the map. It's even under the title of the, <laughs> yeah, like, southeast is under the key, northeast is under the title of the map. I mean, I don't know. I'm just putting that out there. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Thank, thank you for the comment, Commissioner Blacker. Um, we, we have funded projects in all 64 counties, and that is definitely something that's at the forefront of our minds, especially through the competitive uh, side of our, of our house, if you will. Um, and we are hoping with the regional partnerships in reference to that map to continue to build that out. Um, you know, with time, we expect to cover significant portions, if not all of the state. Commissioner Adams. Thank you. Um, so I just want to echo um, Commissioner Blecka's comments around the inequitable distribution of support. Um, and I'm hopeful that uh, we can continue to ensure um, that everybody can benefit from the incredible programs that um, and investments that GOCO makes. Um, I have two quick questions. The first is, um, so, <laughs> have an opposite problem in the Denver area, which we have more people who want to come in than we have space for. And so I was just curious on the update. Um, there are a couple of organizations that have reached out to me saying that they've been told to kind of wait until the next round. And so just wanted to kind of an update on those areas that have an over uh, abundance of requests, but not enough to, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a different type of equity issue. But um, so just want to kind of know the status of that and what I should tell them when they, mm -hmm. or should I just you know, talk to Dan, right? So I'm happy to do that. Um, and then the question, the other question, and, and again, um, I've asked this a little bit and I've been told to wait. So I'm hopeful that there's a, an update around the regional partnership assessments um, that each of them were doing. I know that I was asked to participate in one just as a resident. Um, I feel like that was almost a year and a half ago or something. It felt very, it was a very tokenized experience as well with no follow-up. So um, I do have some concerns around those assessments, um, how residents and visitors are engaged in that, um, and then um, curious about the level of transparency in the results of those. I also think those will be incredibly valuable um, for Colorado Parks and Wildlife as we think about the ways that um, our parks and what state wildlife areas intersect with the different um, opportunities that already exist via GOCO. Thank yeah, you. Perfect. Um, thank you for those comments, Commissioner Adams. I, I think what I'd like to do is I'd like to follow up with you and Commissioner Black on the distribution of our funding through the 64 counties. I don't have that off the top of my head, but I, I know organizationally that is something that we are concerned about and we strive to do. So I, I will research that data and follow up with you both. And then as far as the regional partnership grant round that's currently underway, I do know there was, you know, similar to our concepting phase where a certain number of concepts are accepted and a certain number are invited to application. That process was followed. Um, that's CPW side of the operations are running those grant programs. So our investments are through CPW to that. So I don't know the specifics uh, on that right now, but can certainly look that up and check in with Jody Kennedy at CPW. Yeah. Point of clarification, I'm sorry. I'm not talking about the um, assessments for projects. I'm talking about, it was my understanding that when they did the regional partnerships, each of them, Metro DNA, mm -hmm. no 
co places, et cetera, yeah. were all responsible for creating a kind of a landscape analysis of what's happening in their areas. Like, mm -hmm. you know, what programs are already offering outdoor education or other types of things? You know, do they have parks nearby? Those kinds of mm -hmm. assessments uh, or landscape analysis, depending on uh, the word choice and, and the methodology. But um, and so it was my understanding that that uh, initial assessment was then going to inform kind of how yeah. they wanted to, um, you know, tech provide technical assistance and those kind of other things. And so yeah. the, that's the one I'm talking about, not okay. the ones that are specific to a project. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, to that uh, comment, I think what uh, what is happening is the regional partnerships have a lot of flexibility and liberty and how they go about their regional planning. Um, so we're trying to balance that with the top-down approach of you know what's required in the framework of a plan. They are required to engage the public um, and engage various stakeholder groups. But one last thing on that, Commissioner Adams, is um, we are in the process. We just closed our RFP to bring on that consultant team to assist with the statewide planning efforts. And that piece, I think, will be addressed in that large contract that we hope to award by the end of the year. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And yeah. again, I just raised that it is a, a transparency issue. You know, there are many people that and many organizations that um, competed for those regional partnerships. And, you know, I think it's, it's um, good practice to, to let those folks know that, you know, the folks that were selected are doing the work, mm -hmm. and this is the ways that they're, they're doing the work. So I appreciate the update okay. and looking forward to um, some additional information. Thank you. Alice? No? Okay. Came and went. Are you sure? Oh, no, uh, sorry. Uh, Alice Horgan, uh, Acting Director for Parks, Wildlife, and Land. Um, to Commissioner uh, Blecka and um, uh, to your point, Commissioner Adams, about um, the Northeast region, um, that is something that Dan has directed me to work on, especially with new members of the le legislature coming on board from that area to talk through um, potential avenues for partnerships, talking about what this can mean for their communities and raising it at that level to try to help, um, you know, getting legislators involved in soliciting um, and talking out to their community. Um, and so that's something that I've been directed to do. So, like that. Okay. Okay, I don't think I see any others. All right, thank, thank you. you very much, Dan. Thank you. Okay, we are now on item number 25, um, which is the RBS 9 Arkansas River Bighorn Sheep Herd Management Plan, and we're gonna do a couple of these, so turn it to Brian Lamont. See you out there. I am here, can you see me and hear me? Yes, I think so. Speak up. <laughs> All right, excellent. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Directors. My name is Brian Lamont, and I'm the terrestrial biologist in Area 13, which is out of our Salida office. I'm here to give you a brief summary of the RBS 9 Sheep Management Plan and to answer any questions you may have based on the pre recorded presentation that you received in your mailing. RBS 9 is located in South Central Colorado near the towns of Buena Vista, Salida and Canyon City. Bighorns in this population primarily winter and summer at mid to lower elevations with a good portion of the herd spending much of the year near the Arkansas River. The herd is currently stable and holds approximately 350 to 400 sheep and encompasses bighorn sheep units S7, S47, S49 and S79. Issues for this sheep herd include a decline in the quality and quantity of habitat, transmission of disease from domestic sheep and goats, and the increase in year-round recreation. Management is not expected to change significantly with the approval of this plan. We are proposing to maintain the current herd size of 350 to 400 sheep and manage for an average age of harvested ram of four to six years old. The three-year average age of harvested rams has been around five years old since 2003. These objectives will allow for a sustainable herd while providing excellent hunting and viewing opportunities for the public. That was just a quick overview of the plan. Thanks so much for your time this morning, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, any questions on this plan? Uh, Commissioner Bailey. Uh, maybe just a point of clarification for the behind the scene team, team, teams. Did we get a recording of these? Because I don't. Okay, I might have just missed that then. 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. But if, anyway, I did read it through, so I think I'm good with my question. I wanted to ask specifically about the um, maintaining of effective separation between um, the the sheep and then the sort of hobbyist uh, uh, sheep and, and goat operations and. I just a little unclear on maybe how the, how we approach doing that. It sounds like it's some combination of partnerships. One of the letters that I saw at the end also mentioned the potential for an educational campaign. So I was just curious about how we're approaching that effective separation goal. Mr. Dreyer. Okay. Right. Yeah. Thanks for that com uh, question, Commissioner Bailey. Um, yeah. So so it is through. It is a little bit difficult because these are private landowners. Um, so we do our best um, through trying to reach out uh, from an education perspective, talking to them. There's quite a few folks that actually, you know, aren't aware of the concern um, that can occur between domestics and our wild sheep populations. And so just getting it on their radar to actually allow them to understand those concerns is a big part of that ed education. And then also the second piece of that is just having really good communication with these folks and making sure that, let's say, a bighorn ram ends up in their pen, that they communicate with us uh, to make sure that we're aware of that so that we can handle that situation before that ram re-enters um, you know, the bigger herd perspective. Uh, so yeah, just a couple of those pieces are, are what we strive to do here in, in the local local areas. Okay, Commissioner Touchton and then Commissioner Vardy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, like I see the way it's to, to Brian. <laughs> so, um, one of the Brian's, um, there was a paper uh, that came out uh, within the last month uh, uh, by Joel Berger, Dr. Joel Berger, that said um, when there's habitat competition between goats and bighorns, the goats always win. And so I was wondering if there, if there are issues involving competition with goats in this region? So with this particular herd, there are not. Um, this is a lower elevation herd um, where we do not see mountain goats. So in this situation, that that is not. Now with some of our other herds, our higher elevation herds, that can be a consideration for sure. Okay, Commissioner Barty. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, question about, uh, I, I recently heard about a, um, uh, some sort of prototype or study that was taking place to develop um, domestic disease resistant lambs. And I wanted to, to learn if, if CPW is involved or promoting or, or doing anything with that effort. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Um, commissioners, directors, um, Brian Dreher, terrestrial section manager. So we do participate in, in wild sheep working group through WAFWA. And a lot of those are organized efforts um, in that regard. Now, are we actively doing that here in Colorado? Um, Commissioner Vardy, no. Uh, but we are, we participate in association with, if that makes sense, in some of those efforts. And our partnership also with Wild Feet Sheep Foundation and, and all of those as well. Okay, any other questions on this item? Okay, not seeing any. So we will move on to the next one. My pages are out of order. Um, item number 26, which is D28 on the Arkansas River Deer Herd Management Plan. And I, I agree. I'll maybe ask Laura, like you link the other things in our agenda, if you could link it a little bit more obviously to these videos, it would be helpful. It was a, a little hard to find this time. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Good morning, Madam Chair, Commissioners, Directors. My name is Jonathan Wrights, and I'm the Area 12 Biologist based out of Lamar. I'll be giving a brief summary and answering questions regarding the deer management plan drafts for both the D28 and D33 deer herds. Thank you for your time reviewing the plans and watching the pre-recorded presentations. We'll get started with D28. D28 is the Arkansas River deer herd. It includes game management units along the Arkansas River from Pueblo to the Kansas-Colorado border. It also includes the GMUs along the Kansas border from Cheyenne Wells south to the Oklahoma border. The draft herd management plan lists a preferred population objective range of 6,000 to 8,000 deer 
which lines up with the last few years of population estimates for the herd. The plan proposes maintaining deer numbers at their current levels. The preferred sex ratio listed in the plan is a range of 30 to 35 bucks per 100 does, which falls in line with the last couple of years of observed sex ratios. This would be a decrease in sex ratio from the previous objective of 43 bucks per 100 does. We're proposing the ratio of 30 to 35 bucks per 100 does, as we believe that it will be the best balance that we can strike between reducing buck doe ratios in order to reduce CWD prevalence rates while still offering relatively good opportunity for buck harvest. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have regarding the Arkansas River deer herd or its draft herd management plan. Okay, questions on this one? I don't see any. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Mr. Reading. Go ahead. Thank Mr. you, Madam Reading. Chair. Um, yeah, Jonathan, um, my question is that this is a huge area and it um, most of the deer I imagine are um, concentrated along the Arkansas River, River Valley bottom. So I'm wondering if we, if there's a chance you could increase that population of deer elsewhere and why we don't shoot for a higher number, especially off the Arkansas River. Sure, you bet. So uh, one thing to note, um, just with the, the proposed population objective range of 6,000 to 8,000, it's a significant increase over the previous objective of 3,600. So, so we're looking to take a pretty significant bump in the, the objective there, um, which is supported by landowners and, and hunters as they, they're, uh, for the most part, most support is for keeping the population at status quo of what it what has been in, in recent years. Um, you're right in the population, the bulk of the population is along the Arkansas River. Uh, however, all the, all the game management units included within this DAU have high concentrations of both mule deer and whitetail deer along riparian areas. And, and uh, these game management units included in this DAU were all lumped together uh, as, as we really do run pretty high deer densities on a lot of uh, drainages throughout all the GMUs included in the DAU. Um, as far as increasing the population, I mean, this is, this is a population where we very much have, have some management control through doe harvest, um, but really we're, while there's not a lot of issues with game damage, um, we're kind of on the cusp. If you talk to, to any of the local district wildlife managers that are dealing with game damage issues, if you talk to a lot of the local landowners, um, most of these landowners, especially those that have irrigated cropland along the Arkansas River Valley, or those that have uh, you know, irrigated circles like they grow corn uh, in the uplands of the, of the DAU, they, they all experience, you know, mostly all experience game damage to some, some level with deer. And there are a lot of landowners that are tolerant of levels of damage where they are right now. But if we were to exceed kind of the current population level, we would anticipate far more conflict with game damage than we're seeing now. Another reason to not increase the deer population above where it is currently is concerns over CWD. Uh, as we increase deer densities uh, within the DAU, uh, likely we would also be then increasing CWD prevalence rates as you know, higher densities of deer will likely to have higher uh, prevalence rates of CWD. Um, so that's, that's generally the, the reasons for, for keeping the population where, where it's at. But, but like I say, you know, we, we've been running a relatively stable population over the last 10 years, really the last about 20 years. But prior to that, we had a much lower deer population. So we're, we're really running a deer population in the DAU higher than we've ever seen before, at least in, in recent decades. Thank you. I'm not sure what order, so I'll go Commissioner Bailey and then Commissioner Touchdown. Okay, thanks, Chair. Um, Thanks so much. I think I have a broader question um, separate to this, but I did just want to say it's always great to see the really robust stakeholder outreach that happens with these plans, and the comments are really helpful for kind of understanding the broader picture, so kudos on that work. Related to that, one of the comments I saw, um, and I don't, I don't, I don't know who, who this question is actually for, but I saw it in the comments for this plan and in the other comments that we received under the miscellaneous, uh, are just confusion around boundary zones and, and hunter trespassing. And so maybe it's an item for a future agenda is just understanding a bit more about what information is available to delineation. And so we can discuss how to, how to maybe make it easier for hunters out there to minimize any potential conflict. Thank you, ma'am. Just a nod, maybe? <laughs> is that a yes? <laughs> okay, uh, Commissioner Touchton. Oh, um, morning, Jonathan. Um, it's Jay, uh, in case you can't see on our thing. I, uh, I didn't know you owned a tie, um, so I had to, <laughs> I have to comment on that, first of all. 
Um, Jonathan, uh, you and I have talked about the plans before, uh, but I wondered, I, I, I thought of something that, um, you know, everyone has favorites, and I'm a, I'm a mule deer enthusiast, and I was wondering if there are any issues of competition or displacement between mule deers and whitetails, because I know we don't differentiate one from the other in our planning. Sure, you're getting into kind of treacherous waters here, Jay. <laughs> so, um, well, as far as, um, you know, there, there is uh, a, a lot of um, opinion out there that there's competition, direct competition between whitetail and, and mule deer in the Eastern Plains of Colorado. Um, I know uh, with, with, my, with my time and observations through, through uh, doing classification surveys and time as a district wildlife manager and a lot of time on the, on the ground, what I really see is, is more uh, distinction between deer, white-tailed deer and mule deer using two very different habitat types. Uh, we didn't really have much for white-tailed deer in this DAU uh, or in Southeast Colorado until about the, the mid to late 1970s when they first started showing up and their population has done really well. That also coincided with tamarisk getting established along the Arkansas River Valley and irrigated corn becoming one of the kind of prevalent crops that we have. Most of where you see white-tailed deer is where we have much uh, thicker, denser stands of, of cover, whereas we find a mule deer generally in more of the, the upland country. Um, so I, I think I, my personal opinion based off most of the anecdotal observation is, is that it really is more a habitat related thing, not so much the deer directly competing or whitetails running mule deer out of areas. We've seen areas where the cover has gotten so thick that, that mule deer just don't favor it. For instance, along the Arkansas River Valley, you know, from Lamar East, usually when we fly with helicopter, we may not see a single mule deer there, yet we'll see the mule deer out more up in the uplands and the Sand Sage rangeland and CRP grasslands and, and some of that habitat type. Commissioner May, I'm not sure what um, you're trying to tell us with your <laughs> hand raised, but I'm, I'm going to guess that you're raising your hand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Turn it to you. <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to kind of tag along with, thank you, Madam Chair. I wanted to tag along with Commissioner Bailey's questions about some of the comments as far as delineating ownership and boundaries. And I have to say, especially in Southeast Colorado, there is very little public land. It's private land. Um, CPW has done a great job of acquiring a lot of that private land for walk-in areas. But there is always a conflict every fall about um, people who don't realize where, the, where they are. And Onyx is a great app. Anybody that has the, has the desire to go out and hunt should have Onyx because it absolutely tells you where you are, whose ground you're on. If you want to hunt on a certain piece of property, it tells you who owns it. You can go make those arrangements before. All too often what happens is Somebody will go ahead and hunt a property and hope they don't get discovered on it or caught. And it creates a lot of issues. And what I would like at some point to see if maybe whenever people are, are licensed to hunt in certain areas, that maybe we can facilitate a way that through the Onyx app or maybe just some printed copies that hunters who are in those areas have no doubt of where they are and whose property they want to be on. And they can have those discussions with some of the landowners because it does create a lot of conflict and creates a lot of problems for CPW staff. So I just want to make that comment about there is a way to determine where these boundaries are if somebody really is serious about finding out what they are. Again, Brian Dreo, Terrestrial Section Manager. I'll add to what Dallas just stated there. And I'll say that Onyx now is holding all our walk-in access properties as well. And so when you go out to Southeast Colorado, not only do you know land ownership and everything else, but you also know where our, where our uh, walk-in access agreements are for either big game walk-in access or small game walk-in access. And so certainly we place a lot of responsibility on our hunters to have the right license, to, to know where their, their legal boundary is, to know what species in some instances, because we have both whitetail tags and either species tags out in this part of the world. And then we're also asking them to be on a property that they have permission to be on. And so resources like Onyx have been great for us. And the fact that we can then link our, our public land acres that we can enroll into the program into that, I think has all been a huge asset and an educational opportunity for hunting public. So. 
Okay, Commissioner Haskett and then Commissioner Adams. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we're on the onyx subject. This doesn't have to do with the herd management plan, but so conservation easements sometimes show up on onyx as state wildlife areas. Has that been fixed where it's a, it's made, well, this isn't here. Um, it's, how, it's how it's listed in the tax roll and, and things like that. But I know in my area, some conservation easements show up as state wildlife areas. Yeah, and I, I actually don't know the answer to that. Thanks for the question. I don't, and I don't know at what level we as an agency communicate with the folks that make Onyx, to be truthful with you. It's so. not Onyx. It's actually our state's, um, uh, gotcha. it's how it's listed when we do a conservation easement. And we've talked about this before. Um, I can't remember exactly how it works, but we did talk about it before probably a year or so ago, and I'm just wondering if we've made any progress towards that because we're telling people to use Onyx, but there is a flaw in it that conservation easements are listed. Travis, would you like to jump in? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good morning, Travis Black, Northwest Regional Manager. Um, commissioners, uh, I had a great time here, but uh, to answer your question, uh, Commissioner Haskett, uh, we are working on that. Um, it was something that we started over a year ago, and the two individuals that were working on that are no longer with the agency. So I'm trying to pick that ball up and start moving it forward. Um, we've discussed that at some of our LT meetings uh, within the past couple of months. So it is something we're aware of, um, that they're erroneously listing conservation easements as state wildlife areas. Part of the complicating factor there is on some of those easements, we do have some public access, but it's very limited. And, and it's, it's, it's in how we define what a state wildlife area is and how we display that on a map. And that's what we're trying to work on and try to differentiate in some fashion those limited access properties versus habitat areas or strictly conservation easements versus those that are generally open to the public, a, a typical state wildlife area. So we're aware of the problem and we are working on it. Okay, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Adams. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm sorry, I'm still, I'm still, this is gonna be a growth area not touching this thing. Um, and so, let's see, thank you for this update. Um, I wanted to um, build on um, the comments around Onyx and, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the $360 annual cost of that application. Um, and so I really appreciate um, Commissioner May's reminder that paper copies are available. And I'm curious, because I feel like CPW's site does offer a variety of different maps for hunters in the different area. I mean, is the is that information already available on our website? I'm sorry, I didn't look up the maps this year. I, I did actually use Onyx, but <laughs> so that's a that's a curious. That's one of my questions. Anyone? I guess I I can take that. Um, so as, as far as uh, what's available to the public, as far as what CPW produces, uh, we have a walk-in hunting atlas. So all of the private ground that we lease out annually is on that that paper atlas that gets pr uh, published every year. We have two two atlases. One that that uh, has most of the most of the properties that we enroll uh, during the early sign-up period, and then we have some later enrollment that occurs uh, right before the the bird season opens. So we come out with the second. Uh, publication there. Onyx has been great to work with, with all the, on the walk-in side of things, uh, which is the great thing about Onyx is, is they're, they're, they're willing to update that every year and our, our walk-in enrollment uh, varies year to year. So uh, that's really, sportsmen have really in, enjoyed that here. A lot of good uh, feedback on people using Onyx for the, the walk-in uh, hunting properties. We also have uh, on our website, we have a, a Colorado hunting atlas that is is yeah. great. I mean, I refer to it all the time, even for, for work, uh, that, that you, you get on there. It's an interactive map that, that shows all of our state wildlife areas. And that's updated every year with a lot of our annual agreements, too. So we, we have exchange of use agreements um, and, and annual leases, as well as uh, this, the, the walk-in stuff. And that, that gets updated by our GIS shop every year. Uh, locally... Okay. Um, I know, you know, as we're talking about, you know, D D28 or Southeast Plains, um, we have a lot of annual uh, agreements or exchange of use agreements that um, we, it's not really appropriate for them, them to end up on any uh, long term published map. And so what we do is we also offer paper maps that are available at the local local office. 
but we also make sure that those properties then get listed on on Onyx and on the, the walk and access program. And then for all our state wildlife areas, you can pick up uh, maps with uh, all the, the regulations that apply to that property um, at a local CPW office as well. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that um, the type of information that is provided on Onyx, which is a paid service, is also available to the public via our various um, whether it be online or at an office, again, it's, it's more difficult to compile. You're paying for a, a, a service, right? <laughs> they're compiling and they're making fancy and they're putting it on the phone, but I just wanted to make sure that we are providing this information because again, I do believe as an agency, it is our responsibility to let hunters know where they are allowed to hunt and where they are not. So I just wanted to make sure and confirm that that information is available. So that's very helpful to know. And that actually leads to my next question, which is I'm now curious about both hunter education as well as how we can continue to update hunters around these, pro these particular issues of, of the boundary lines. Um, I guess I can take a stab at that, like since, that? Uh, <laughs> since I'm up. So, so uh, I, I was a district wildlife manager for, for nearly eight years, and uh, I'm a hunter's ed instructor. I know uh, all of the, the hunter's, hunter's ed classes that, that I've taken, uh, part of that class is, is talking to new hunters uh, about uh, map resources that are out there, how, how to be able to, to determine what's private or, or public. And something that's very much emphasized is, is the, you know, the the onus is always on the hunter to know where they are and that there's a, there are a lot of tools for those hunters to be able to determine and figure out where they're at to make sure they're in the right place. And uh, that definitely is emphasized in hunter education courses. Obviously, I, I can really mostly just speak to the courses that I've been involved in, but, but that's, you know, a fairly standard thing to be included in any hunter education course. And I guess I'm just asking again, I um, did hunt this year and I haven't received any kind of like email or, you know, since Hunter Ed, there's no additional information that comes. There's no reminders around, we're seeing this acute issue around boundaries and hunters knowing where they are. And um, and again, as a dues paying member of backcountry hunters and anglers, I'm just also curious if we can perhaps partner with um, other hunting organizations, them or the Colorado Bow Hunters Association, et cetera, just to reinforce, hey, this is an issue that we're starting to see. Can you support us in communicating um, the need of, you know, either, either having pa paper maps or um, having um, the other piece? I'm also wondering if there's potentially an opportunity to provide some orienting courses that help people to better use the paper maps if they do not want to make um, the investment for a private service. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Lifeline. <laughs> Hi, Kristen Cannon. I'm uh, the acting assistant director of the education side of the information and education branch. And I just was going to say, I took notes on what you said for Hunter Education, and um, I don't have anything to add to Jonathan's response. I thought that was really good info, um, but I just wanted to note that I, I took notes on that, and we'll see what we can do. Okay, Commissioner Haskett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just a couple of thoughts. Um, there is an app called Cotrex, which was done by the state, and it does have trails and it does show public and private land. And Onyx is only thirty dollars a year. I I know, but I mean it is at three hundred and sixty dollars a year. It's only thirty dollars a year, but yeah, um, there are some apps out there. I've used several different ones of them. Um, that are free also. Okay, good points taken. Anything else on this item? Okay, thank you. So we'll move to item number 27, which is the D33 Mesa de Maya Deer Herd Management Plan. Okay, thank you. So we'll switch gears to the D33 plan. D33 is the Mesa de Maya Deer Herd. It's located in Eastern Los Angeles County and Western Baca County. It contains game management units 137, 138, 143, and 144. For the last 10 years, there haven't been any significant management concerns in D33. The population is relatively stable. Most landowners indicate that the deer population should be maintained or even increased. There are limited issues with crop damage. 
Most hunters are satisfied with their hunting experiences in D33, and the DAU offers great opportunities to harvest mature mule deer bucks. Over the last 10 years, the population has ranged from an estimated 2,000 to 2,600 deer. The preferred population objective for this plan is a wide range of 2,000 to 3,500. This range maintains the population at its current level, but allows for population increase, which is supported by the majority of both landowners and hunters. Due to the low densities of deer in D33, it isn't cost effective to conduct annual classification helicopter surveys. Instead of managing this population using sex age driven population modeling, we propose the use of alternative metrics such as landowner surveys, hunter surveys, and harvest statistics to guide management. The plan calls for landowner and hunter surveys to be repeated at the midterm of this plan in 2027 and for harvest estimates to be generated every year. By conducting hunter and landowner surveys every five years, CPW will have a formalized process to keep informed about landowner and hunter opinions regarding multiple aspects of D33's management. CPW manages, <coughs> managers will use the results of the surveys to identify any new management concerns that arise. And does anybody have any questions regarding the Mesa de Maya deer herd or the herd management plan? Commissioner Touchton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Hey, Jonathan, I, again, we, we've talked about this, and, and I, um, uh, I, 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 my view was that um, when both hunters and landowners both want more deer, it's a good time to move the population estimate up. And I remember you uh, saying that, that hunting might not be the limiting factor on the, the population here, or that, that um, our take might not be the, you know, what drives the number. And I was curious if you, you know, if you have any thoughts about, because that's a large area with relatively few deer, but what is the limiting factor if it's not our management on why that deer herd won't increase? Sure. Thanks, Jay. That's a, that's a great question. I'm glad you brought it up. So um, our, our deer, our doe harvest, which, you know, usually, you know, you're, you're, you're impacting or managing a deer population through harvest of, of the females. Um, our, our doe harvest is only around 40 to 50 does per, per year. That's only 1.6% of the preseason population that's getting harvested. So for this DAU, this is very different than the previous DAU we just talked about where hunting harvest really isn't the driving force in what's limiting this population. Likely that the population is being limited by the by habitat probably primarily habitat um also predation by by mountain lions and and coyotes um this is also you know being a low deer density you know uh, dau this isn't you know we have to pick and choose we're really putting a lot of effort into researching you know what's what's causing you know what the survival rates are for deer what uh what are causing you know that you know, what are the limiting factors in a, in, a, in a DAU for a herd? What's keeping that population down or impacting it? Um, so, so honestly, it's, those, are, those are unknown. All I can really speak to is that it really, you know, the, the, the numbers show that our hunter harvest isn't really what's limiting the deer herd. I will say, you know, anecdotally, when, when we have drought, is, and as you know, is very, very common in extreme southeast Colorado, um, we really see, you know, a big reduction in the, the doe fawn ratios and the production that we have. So, so really, you know, mother nature and, and drought is one of the driving factors there and that's all tied into, into habitat. And then it gets complicated as you start talking about predators and, you know, you know, a lot of deer fawns are taken by coyotes, for instance, well, drought, you know, impacts what other groceries are available to coyotes. And so they may have a greater impact on, on deer fawns during, during drought years as well. So it's really a dynamic thing with a lot of things at play um, and, and, and unfortunately, we don't have, you know, a really solid understanding of exactly what's going on there. Um, but uh, like I said, we, we do know that it's not hunter harvest that's keeping it down. Um, and very much, as you'd see with any, any population of most every wildlife species in southeast Colorado, there is a lot of, you know, just natural boom bust cycles that are, are primarily drought driven. Okay. I don't see any other questions on this. Okay, thank you very much. Um, oh, sorry, Dallas. <laughs> Thanks, Madam Chair. Sorry, I don't ever want, <laughs> since you're not in the room, I don't want to step in front of somebody else. No, please go ahead. Um, you, uh, you sort of have the, we will defer to you because you're okay. at, at a disadvantage. So go ahead. I just wanted to add to this. I didn't want this topic to go without mentioning 
that there's another very important thing in this um, management unit besides the deer we're talking about. And that's one of the most robust, healthy populations of Colorado bighorn in the state of Colorado. And I think probably a lot of people don't realize that, but I don't want to miss an opportunity to speak to that. Most people wouldn't realize that in Southeast Colorado, the area that was under the key, it has the most robust, healthy population of Colorado bighorn in the state. Yeah, Commissioner May is, is, is right there. And, and I think that, you know, for, for many people in the state of Colorado, they don't realize or have no sense of what exists south of the Arkansas River, east of I-25. And the reality is we have canyons that extend all the way uh, nearly to Highway 287, pretty close to the Kansas border. And uh, like Commissioner May said, you know, we, we have a couple of uh, um, excuse me, bighorn sheep herds down there one of which is, is likely the biggest bighorn sheep herd in the state. Some really beautiful country. So uh, definitely uh, worth, if you guys have the opportunity to spend some time down there and get to know some of this country, it's, it's well worth exploring. Okay. I, oh, sorry, Commissioner Adams. Go ahead. Sorry. sorry. I mean, darn. Um, I'm good on, on this particular part, but I didn't want to come back because Jake did show me that I was wrong. See, I'm a cap I'm capable of running I'm wrong. Um, about the $30 a year versus $30 a month. So I do apologize that about that for Onyx. However, my larger point is I don't I wanted to make sure that we have free resources available and it was very helpful to know that we do provide both paper and online copies of where the boundaries are <laughs> and where they are supposed to be. And I'm happy also to hear that there's interest in um, supporting and working with our partners to better share and get that message out. But I do, um, you know, I have concerns around lifting up you know, private things when we are a public agency. And so I'm just very mindful of always having, um, and we're also equity driven and hunting is already an expensive sport to get into. And so the better that we can um, ensure that we've got a stretch of opportunities um, to ensure that people can meet the regulations that we have will be critical. Thank you. Okay, I think we can move on from this item. Thank you from commissioners. The Sure, appreciate it. Thank you very much for all the effort and work that goes into these. I know that's extensive. Okay, um, we have a couple of public comments. Um, I think these are particular to um, the Mad Rabbit Trail system uh, near Steamboat Springs. So uh, I think we have a couple of folks that are um, joining us virtually. So we'll do that and then we will go to um, Dallas, just for your benefit, we'll go to 29.2 on consent that we pulled off and then we will go to the consent agenda. Okay, Katie. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you Madam Chair. Yeah, so we had two people pre-register for public comment. I think we've got one logged in so far. So we'll start with Gaspar Paracone and uh, Luke Weedle will be after that if he logs on. Um, Gaspar, looks like we have you coming up. Uh, go ahead, Gaspar. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. My name is Gaspar Paracone, and I'm coming to you today wearing two different hats. First, as chair of the Colorado Wildlife Conservation Project, and secondarily, as a member of uh, the local group Keep Route Wild. Both organizations had asked me to speak to the recently released environmental assessment concerning the Forest Service's Mad Rabbit Trails proposal. The uh, proposed action just north of Steamboat Springs intends to add about 52 miles of new trails construction in addition to the 500 miles of existing trails. And I'd like to note from the outset here that we do acknowledge that the um, recent surge in outdoor recreation undeniably demands uh, new trail development, but we also think it can be done in a way that doesn't offer a deleterious impact to both um, wildlife and wildlife habitat. And unfortunately, this current proposal greatly misses that mark, in our opinion, and represents a pretty serious threat to the long-term prospects of the elk herd, other wildlife, and sensitive uh, that's sensitive to human disturbance, and uh, the undenying or the undeveloped characteristics of our uh, local roadless area. Um, we do understand that CPW has engaged in a cooperating agency status with the Forest Service on this project, and we have greatly appreciated their continued efforts to ensure that the Forest Service conduct, conducts due diligence as required by NEPA. 
Um, our organization previously submitted a compromise proposal to the Forest Service that would have struck a balance of increasing outdoor recreation while protecting the, the critical and sensitive wildlife habitat in the area. Unfortunately, the uh, released environmental assessment seems to have largely ignored those recommendations, which is why we are in front of you today. But um, our, our ask at this point is that a no action alternative be adopted until a proper environmental impact statement has been conducted. And here's why. The, the current plan was conducted in 19, on a 1998 force plan, which is takes no stretch of the imagination to understand, woefully out of date. And uh, it has only been compound, compounded by the fact that they have avoided any of the uh, cumulative impact assessments in the valley. If this were to be approved, the plan would constitute the fifth consecutive piecemeal development without any cumulative impact assessment. Moreover, there are roughly 21 miles of proposed trails in an acknowledged elk calving area that will have no seasonal closures of any kind. Um, not only does the plan fail to include such baseline standards as seasonal closures, but it virtually has no mention of the intent to mitigate wildlife impacts through an adaptive management scheme or criteria that could lead to enforcement. Um, just to wrap up here, what's worse is the Forest Service is uh, effectively making the claim that by brushing out illegal trails um, that have been pirated uh, on the landscape from future trail development, they are then justified in the development of new trails. And it's hard for us to imagine how if, uh, the proper enforcement wasn't on hand to the Forest Service the first time around, how we won't see similar impacts just on a much larger landscape this time around. And it happens that the second largest elk herd in the world is um, very likely to head the way that we have seen out of Vail and Durango if some of those standards aren't in place. And so again, um, you know, outdoor recreation and wildlife protection isn't a zero sum game by any stretch. And I think both can exist in concert. Um, but we do hope that you will consider asking the Forest Service to go back to the drawing board and ensure that some of these baseline standards that we are requesting find their way into a final draft. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take any questions if there happen to be any. I don't see any. Thanks very much, former member of this commission, and appreciate um, some of the commentary that came in um, in writing as well on this topic. So go ahead, Katie. And it does like that they have Luke Weedell. So if we could get Luke unmuted, please. And Luke, would you like your camera on? Sure, Katie. You might need to hit accept on your end. Hey, good morning. And um, just for clarification, this comment was actually with respect to the search for new director and, and not Mad Rabbit. Um, is this an okay time? Yeah, go ahead, Luke. Uh, Madam Chair Hauser and Director Gibbs, Acting Director Dugan and Commissioners, good morning. Uh, my name is Luke Weedle, and I'm here on behalf of the uh, Colorado Wildlife Conservation Project, the CWCP. Um, the CWCP is an alliance of, of diverse wildlife organizations with a common interest in, in conserving wildlife and wildlife habitats and in preserving our hunting and angling and conservation heritage. We're comprised of 19 alliance organizations and uh, collectively represent tens of thousands of outdoor enthusiasts across Colorado. I'm here today to express our coalition's desires with respect to the upcoming process and the selection of a new director. Um, and would also like to take a moment to, um, to acknowledge the admirable job that Acting Director Dugan has done in her current role. Uh, statute 339103 states uh, that the commission, with the consent of the executive director, shall appoint the director. The legislature has, has crafted this process such that wildlife management is insulated from political influence. Um, with the recent surge in outdoor recreation and increases in hunter and angler participation across the state, um, the challenges before this next director will be significant. The dual mission of CPW, the promotion of outdoor recreation and responsible wildlife management, is like never before at a crossroads. And so we hope that the new director will have a clear understanding of how to properly balance these two, interse these two intersects in a way that... Um, or these interests rather in a way that protects and promotes wildlife and wildlife habitat through a smart approach to outdoor recreation growth. And this holistic approach is, is more important than ever. So with that said, we just have two quick suggestions when it comes to your upcoming search. Number one, 
Um, as the CWCP is steadfast in our efforts to continue the state's long history of responsible science-based wildlife management, we appreciate this commission's commitment to the North American model of wildlife conservation. And we appreciate, um, well, we hope this comes into play as you choose the best candidate for the position. The director should uphold the North American model with an understanding of the role that CPW's customers, hunters, and anglers play in responsible play in responsible wildlife management. It's not an accident or a coincidence that Colorado is home to the most robust wildlife populations in the West, and the envy of other state and game agencies, fish agencies. And secondly, we thought the process for identifying previous directors was valuable. So particularly the inclusion of, of various CPW stakeholders. We encourage the CNR to convene a third party advisory group to assist in evaluating the qualifications of candidates. And I'm sorry I missed the, the conversation surrounding that yesterday. So we appreciate your time and your, your, your commitment to Colorado's resources. And we sincerely appreciate your leadership on a search for a new director. Thank you. Thank you, that concludes our public comment. Thank you very much to those who joined us for public comment today, Commissioner Touchton. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I uh, thought um, Mr. Weedle was gonna talk more about Mad Rabbit, so I, I held uh, my question. But Sorry, I, go ahead, I, I did too, um, that was my mistake. Thanks for um, that, sorry for the sequencing. Oh, uh, um, uh, I, I was curious if, if maybe someone on, st on staff could give an update on, on Mad Rabbit. You know, one of the things I read was that it, it violates our guidance as expressed in that building trails and wildlife, with wildlife in mind. Mm -hmm. And when um, even one of our partners, like the Forest Service, goes forward with something that we know will have harmful impacts, um, I feel like we should be prepared to administratively challenge their decision I mean, I know there's a deadline for that, and I don't want to make Jake's life more complicated. But I think if if we're if the concerns are meritorious, um, we should administratively follow up with the Forest Service through legal mechanisms, not just the behind the scenes cajoling that doesn't seem to be working. Vanessa, I see you're willing to jump into this. So I'll turn it to you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, Vanessa Mazal, Policy Advisor with the Department of Natural Resources. I've been working very closely with um, our area wildlife manager, Chris Middledorf, up in, um, in the Steamboat area um, and the Forest Service on, on providing some recommendations on this. So very close to, uh, very close to this project. Um, and in fact, we had hoped to have uh, public comments for, uh, delivered to you so that you could understand the state's perspective uh, before this meeting, because I think that we do have we do have some valuable input to provide. <clears throat> I would just say that um, you, yes, you're right, Commissioner. The um, there are uh, some some of the uh, trail development um, some some of the in particular one one area of the trail development um, does uh, exceed the density uh, limitations that are recommended by CPW's land use policy, and also. Um, um, we do have we have expressed and continue to to be concerned about some of the mitigation strategies um, and avoidance strategies. But we do we we are not likely at this point. Although we haven't finalized our comments, I would say that we're not likely to suggest a no action alternative at this point, because we do think that there's a pathway um, through uh, through you know more more effective uh, controls and safeguards for protected resources um, to. Uh, chart a path, a, a, a course forward, I would say. So um, we're working very closely with the Forest Service to, um, to try and, you know, identify that measured approach. And I think we will withhold our, our, our judgment, I would say, um, at, at the end of the day to, uh, to see what the final, uh, the final plan might look like. I'm happy to answer I'm, additional I'm questions. Gonna, I'm going to go back to Commissioner Touch and I imagine it's follow up. Okay. And then yeah. Commissioner Haskett. Well, well, well two, two things, and, and thank you for that. You know, it's it's one thing to be hopeful that you can change the Forest Service's mind, um, but it, I would like to have in my back pocket an administrative appeal. It will increase your leverage, um, and if you don't use it, you lose it. So you will miss the deadline. So uh, if things don't work out with the Forest Service, you'll have no recourse. So 
I always err on the side of uh, sue first and say sorry later. Um, the, 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 uh, um, but but the, uh, the other thing that really concerns me, and I hope it gets addressed, is there are all these illegally created trails. And uh, in some sense, the Forest Service is rewarding the illegal creation of trails. Uh, when a, a trail is illegally created, I think it should be obliterated and you don't replace it. That rewards the folks who it broke the rules. And so I, I hope that we express that view to the Forest Service that you cannot reward illegally created trails or they've actually failed to manage their land. Um, and so I just hope that message comes through, but thank you. I, I will just add that, that, sorry, I know that I wasn't called upon. I hope it's okay to just add, add to that, but we have, we have previously commented as well um, in, in our public comments that we disagree that it is appropriate to enforce existing management direction, i.e. kind of the prohibition of, of non-system trails um, and, and the rehabilitation of those trails uh, through a new NEPA management action or decision rather. So, so we, we would agree with the perspective that there are some concerns about that. And, and that is why we're working with them to try and um, identify other potential opportunities to mitigate those potential impacts. Travis, since you're sitting in the hot seat, do you want to add anything before I go to Commissioner Haskett or? Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Travis Black, Northwest Regional Manager. Um, I, I think Vanessa covered it pretty well. I, I just point out that, you know, we're, we're currently in that comment period. Um, so uh, Commissioner Tuxton, I don't know that we're, we're at that point yet. We're ready to, uh, you know, protest, if you will. So um, I think Vanessa said, you know, we're, we're working on drafting our comment now. Um, and that will be submitted to the Forest Service. And we, we, we do have some concerns with uh, the EA and the way it came out. Um, I believe um, our AWM, Chris Middledorf, might be on as well and, and certainly can speak to it better than I can, his involvement of, you know, from day one when this project was proposed years ago. So uh, Chris has worked very closely, you know, with uh, the communities, uh, with Keeper Out Wild, with the, the mountain bike enthusiast up there. And uh, like I said, likely can, can address this better than I can. So I'd like to give Chris the opportunity. Okay, go ahead. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, Commissioners, Directors. Chris Mildorf, Area Wildlife Manager in Steamboat Springs. I don't have a lot more to add. We've been involved in this process for about five years now, since 2017 with the Forest Service. We've uh, developed a route recreation and conservation roundtable. There's a lot of community input. There are certainly different opinions and values and what people would like to have within our community. But I want to assure you that we have been working very closely with the Forest Service and our partners on this project. Uh, Commissioner Touchton, right now we're in a comment period for 30 days. We will provide comments and then the Forest Service will go back, analyze all of the public comments and come out with their draft record decision. And at that point in time, Vanessa, myself, DNR and CPW can have that conversation of how we take those steps forward. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Haskett. And Commissioner May, you had a sort of a hand up and down as now, or did that did your question get answered? Yes, uh, yes thank you, Madam Chair. What I wanted to say, I'm glad to see Area Manager Middledorf come on because I had had these discussions with him previously, and I had some concerns about some of the media reports I'd read that was painting CPW in maybe a not too favorable light. I found out that those were not accurate. CPW is in a much more active role than they were um, painted as having in that report. So I have been a critic of the things that we've been talking about and the destruction of wildlife habitat, the separation of an elk herd, basically creating a resident elk herd that can't migrate. All those concerns have been brought up, but I have full confidence that CPW is on top of that. And I, that was what I wanted to speak about. So I'm thankful that Area Manager Middledorf came on to address that. Thanks, Commissioner May. Commissioner Haskett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I echo both what Commissioner May and Touchton have said. And um, when I first saw the size of this project, um, I was absolutely, um, I don't even know the words. I couldn't believe how big it was. And But the loss of habitat, um, the recreational use is huge. So. Um, I think we need to make sure we keep right on top of this and um, 
if they're looking at something that's over 20 years old for recreation use, um, that's pretty sad. We, uh, a lot has changed in Colorado in 20 years in our population. I'm not sure in that time, but I'm sure it's more than doubled. So there's a lot of use out there, but the habitat, it's crucial to wildlife if it's winter or cabin grounds, all that stuff. We Seasonal closures need to be in place, things like that. So um, thank you, Chris, for keeping on top of it. And um, if we need to move forward, we need to do it quickly. Thank you. Commissioner Blacker. Thank you. Um, just a few comments. Um, this is a huge system that they're trying to put in, in, in a very heavily used space. Um, there is so much recreation pressure in that area. Um, it's pushing wildlife onto private land, and that's impactful, like year round. And so, yeah, I, you know, moving forward, I'm glad that we're taking an active role in that, and I, you know, think that we need to be, you know, act, continue to be actively engaged because I don't think that there's a way to get out of this without our input. I mean, it's just like, it's such a special area and it's so heavily recreated at all costs. Like, you know, they put in that huge parking lot up there on, you know, uh, up on top of rabbit ears there. It's just, it's, there's no end to it. There's no shoulder season. There's no mud season anymore. It's just 365 and things are louder and bigger and faster and they get into the back country and all the time. So if there's any way that we can help mitigate that at any level, I think that we should do it in whatever tools that we have. So thank you for everybody and that's involved with us. Commissioner Adams. Thank you. Um, thank you. And it also got me thinking about um, how we can better leverage opportunities like the Partners in the Outdoors Conference and some of the other communication levers that we have um, to better communicate recreational impacts on public land. I just, you know, we all say these things because you can see them all the time because you're there. But if you're only there for three hours, you don't realize it. Or if you're there for a couple of days, you don't realize, it. and when people say, oh, and the, the deer go to public land, that, that doesn't mean anything if you don't know what that actually looks like and, and means. And so I'm hopeful as we continue to strengthen the communication and outreach and partnership relationships that, um, that we can better articulate the impacts. Um, and, and I know a lot of this work is already happening with some of the trail organizations, climbing organizations, right? Um, and many others are working hard to, to um, better understand the impacts that we make. But with the increased, I mean, five, five, fold, tenfold in some areas, um, I think we need some better visuals, right? On, on how, um, what those impacts look like and, and better champions and messengers um, to help people to, to really understand um, and change behavior. Thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Um, I'm, I would only make a comment because I'm pretty familiar with this area as well. And um, I'm, also er I'm also very aware of the crowding on other parts of the systems, Emerald Mountain and other places in and around Steamboat. So, it is one of those sort of water balloon questions. You know, you push one side and it goes out the other. So I, I do think it's our responsibility to also look at this very holistically. Um, and I trust that that will be part of um, our um, approach uh, in this and obviously collaborating with the Forest Service and other partners on exploring this. So we are loving our state to death as the old adage goes. So however we can wrestle with that and understand that um, there are parts of that area um, that are, are really impacted right now. And so I don't, it's hard to know how to offset that. Um, conversations about permitting and reservation times and all that to mountain bike on certain trails and so forth. So, and that may be where we're going, but um, that's some of the impact as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Gaspar for bringing that up and for our team for being ready to respond to that. This is obviously not the only time we'll have the conversation about this topic. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, so we're going to move to uh, item 29.2 and I think we have the staff um, available on this as well. 
online. Okay, great. So Dallas, uh, Commissioner May, you asked that this be um, removed from consent. So I'll turn it to you for a moment and then um, we have staff available to respond. Thank you, Madam Chair. My reason for pulling this off the consent agenda is really twofold. First of all, I studied all of the information. I spoke with staff involved. And I think the reasons for the denials are valid, and I agree with them. But I felt it was important to bring this out in public forum so that we could discuss it, especially due to some of the issues that have been mentioned lately, such as trust, um, trust the public has in CPW, the trust that livestock producers have in CPW, and the trust that pro-wolf advocates have. I think it's important that we show what happened in this case, essentially. And the fact that CPW did investigate this, the proper protocols were followed. And I want to, I want to especially bring light to the fact that yesterday it was mentioned a couple of times, and I think unduly the criticism was levied against CPW staff that they do not have the ability or the, the desire to investigate some of these things fully. I, for one, I've had direct experience for years that CPW has great forensic investigation abilities and they use them. The thing that needs to be realized is a lot of these instances happen over thousands of acres of almost inaccessible property and the difficulty in getting somebody to that place in the proper time to get some of this done is not like a crime scene somewhere in a public area. It's very difficult. So. I just wanted to, I asked Regional Manager Black if we could do this so that we could describe what happened and why these denials were put in place so that there is a full revelation to the public of this wasn't just simply an arbitrary decision to deny these game damage claims, but there was a process behind it and that process was followed properly. So that's why I asked for this to be removed off the agenda rather than just be swept under the rug. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner May. Uh, Travis, I'm gonna kick this off. Yes, ma'am, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Travis Black, Northwest Regional Manager yet again. Um, happy to talk about this. Uh, as Commissioner May said, we did have a conversation um, and, and I agreed with his, his approach of pulling this off consent agenda to make the public aware of exactly why these two claims were denied. Um, I, I believe we still have AWM Chris Middledorf on as well, and uh, at, at risk of, uh, you know, the old adage of a copy of a copy is always worse. I, I think it's better to get that directly from the horse's mouth in this case. So um, I, I will chime in briefly, but I'll let Chris kind of jump in. Um, you know, his staff were there, there on the ground investigating these two claims. Um, so I'll just kind of hit the highlights real quick and turn it over to Chris. So. Um, we're talking about two different claims here. Um, one that was uh, labeled 10Y2301 and the second Y2303, I believe. Um, in the first claim, we were notified on 419 of 22 that a, a calf had been ran by wolves. Um, and, and what that means is uh, in, from the rancher's perspective, uh, wolves likely spooked that herd, ran them in some fashion. And uh, that calf, uh, as a newborn calf, you know, two or three day old calf, cannot run long distances. They're, they haven't developed their, their upper respiratory system real well and potentially could cause damage to the lungs of that calf. Um, the calf was still alive. It was not killed by the wolves. There were no injuries that were indicated on the calf. Um, but the calf did have difficulty breathing and was being treated um, or doctored, uh, to use their words. Um, there were no tracks identified in the immediate vicinity. There were no bite marks on the calf. Um, at the time frame, uh, collar data from the male, you got to recall back at this time, the collars were still working, correct? Um, the, the male 2101, his collar was still working. We were able to verify that he was about 12 and a half miles away from the ranch at the time this occurred. Um, that certainly doesn't preclude other wolves from being in the area. But it, it uh, you know, typically what we've seen is uh, that pack follows that male. Um, uh, later, uh, recall this occurred on 419. On 422, uh, the rancher did find some wolf tracks in the immediate vicinity. 
uh, DWMs and uh, the AD, or acting, acting, I can't even talk today, the assistant AWM at the time, Josh Dilley responded um, and verified wolf tracks in the immediate vicinity. However, those tracks were not necessarily fresh tracks, nor could we with 100% certainty say those tracks were there at the time that this calf was ran. Um, a necropsy of the calf after it died showed no, no further bite marks. Um, however, a one inch hole was indicated in one of the calves lungs. Um, so like I said, no external evidence of, of wolves. Uh, we, we couldn't positively put wolves on scene at the time. Um, but I'm gonna jump on to the second one. The, the, the second calf was about the same time frame on 419, CPW was notified that a calf had been trampled by the cows, if you will. Um, there was no damage once again on the calf, no bites, no bites or rake marks. Um, the rancher was positive it had been trampled by the, the cows. cows. Um, he did say range riders were in that vicinity that night and reported no activity of wolves. Um, once again, uh, didn't see any wolves on the ranch that morning as well. Um, he disposed of the calf before CPW had an opportunity to, to do any sort of investigation. Um, on 422, once again, the uh, rancher found tracks in the vicinity, two sets, with one of those sets being somewhat fresh, the other being approximately at the time that the calf was trampled, to the best of our estimate. Um, he did state that he wanted to file a claim um, that occurred weeks later just to document the incident. Um, that the rancher in this case failed to turn in his game damage claim. He was reminded on 719 of 22 that he was up against that 90 day timeline to turn his uh, game damage claim in. Uh, he finally did turn a game damage claim in, but it was on the 25th, 725 of 22. Um, so on both of these incidents, there was no indication of direct wolf contact. Uh, the trampled calf was disposed of before the DWM could investigate or inspect it. Tracks were found in the vicinity, but after the fact, um, the claim, one claim was submitted uh, after the 90 day time frame, And then uh, on the second claim, the, the rancher put a value of $3,000 on the calf and simply didn't provide enough documentation to show the value of that calf. He did provide a letter of support where the fall calf market was projected to be somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,200, um, but could not substantiate the claim for 3,000. So CPW chose to deny both of those claims uh, based on the lack of evidence and uh, the tardiness of the claim being turned in. Um, so with that, I would I'd try to give Chris the opportunity to maybe fill in some gaps or Correct me if I misspoke, Chris. Again, good morning, everyone. I know uh, our game damage coordinator, Luke Hoffman, is on the call as well, and he might have some comments or be able to answer some questions. Regional Manager Black, I think you covered everything. The one thing I do want to share is that the Gittleson family has been dealing with this since January, February of 2022. And they've been excellent partners with CPW to go out and Don's property anytime to be able to see what the operation looks like. He's invited CPW staff to go out and do PAP testing. So I want you to know that there's a relationship there with the Gittlesons that I believe is strong. And Don is filing these claims to make sure they are on the record as well. As far as the details of the incidents, I think Regional Manager Black covered them very well. And if you have any other questions for me, I'm more than happy to try to answer them. Commissioner Bailey and then Commissioner Touchton. Um, not really a question. I do think this process, and again, thanks to Commissioner May for bringing it out because I think it's a good point for discussion. Uh, as I was reading through the denial claims, it was actually a little bit less clear to me the reason for denial than in some of the cases that I've read for, that, for other things that have been on the consent agenda. So I think it points to um, particularly, particularly as these types of claims, claims go under increased scrutiny, whether they're denied or not, just being really explicit about the reason for denial or approval. Um, right, because we know people, for the trust perspective, uh, from, from all sides, I think that's going to be really important. The other piece of this is just the reality of uncertainty and thinking about how we communicate that and the difficulty and inherent challenge of communicating uncertainty, particularly when there are concerns around trust. So, um, yeah, no, no real questions. Um, thanks for all the hard work. And just as we're going forward, thinking about the increased scrutiny these types of game damage claims might have. Commissioner Touchstone. 
Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I guess this is probably more of a comment too, but first off, thanks to Dallas. I, I think uh, Dallas, as usual, is wise that we get these things out in the open and, and discuss them, uh, particularly toward the, the trust issue. And I, the, the point I, I wanted to make primarily was we are currently evaluating these claims under the rules as they exist right now and uh, not the rules that are being debated by the stakeholder group. So the rules of when we pay a claim might change in the future, but currently we have to play by the rules we've, we've got. And I, I think we were more than fair in this instance. Um, I, I think the, the gentleman involved has had other claims paid. And I think some of the factors told me that he probably didn't even expect these claims to get paid. He was just filing them to create a record of everything that had transpired. For instance, blowing a 90-day deadline and not providing any support for uh, a $3,000 calf, which is probably about triple the usual price. Uh, it, it didn't seem like it was that serious, in my view, that he thought these would be denied because there wasn't very good evidence. So anyway, I, I, I think staff did the right thing here, and, and again, just to remind the public, the rules might change, but under the rules as they exist today, I think this was the correct result. Okay. Uh, concur. Thank you to Commissioner May for pulling this up and for the opportunity to have a conversation, and to Travis and your team. We know how hard they work um, in the field and um, creating those partnerships and trust with our stakeholders um, and uh, residents and others uh, in these parts of the state. So thank you for that. Sorry, Commissioner Blecka. I just, um, I want to make a comment, but not regarding this. I just okay, I know like Commissioner Haskett has one too, so. Okay. Um, can we do the consent agenda first and then we'll just close it out? Does that sound like a good sequence? Okay. So for, um, so then we will, um, I'll call a motion to approve the consent agenda. Or I guess we need to do 29.2 first since that's now off. Is that right, Jake? Okay. So I'll, I'll accept a motion for um, item 29.2 um, as indicated. Commissioner Bailey. I'll second. And Commissioner Touchton. Um, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Okay, now we will go to the balance of the consent agenda. So I will um, invite a motion to approve the consent agenda in its remaining form. So Commissioner Blecka and Commissioner Reading. Okay, all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Okay, any opposed, same sign. Okay, uh, we're done with the formal agenda. I know we have a couple of commissioners that like just good of the order, anything that you'd like to add. So I'll go to Commissioner Blecka. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take the time um, in the spirit of, uh, you know, eating crow, essentially. Um, you know, I voted against this meeting schedule based on Gateway. It was so far, <laughs> it is like so far from my house. It's like literally the furthest place we could go. And I just kept going for like each meeting was like further and further. I was like, oh my gosh. Um, <clears throat> but I will say, that this has been my favorite meeting that I've been to in three and a half years. Not because of the location, but because yesterday afternoon, this room was filled with people that looked like me, that I could relate to. There was a woman, Mrs. Castro, sat there and said, I'm not a fifth generation producer, but I married into it. That is me. That, you don't get those conversations. I've never seen a room filled with people that looked, had the same like, lifestyle as me in the three and a half years. It's always, sorry, Metro Mountain Yuppies. And so that was so fulfilling. And there were kids crawling around on the floor. Like that was like life, like that is how I lived. And so that was so uplifting. And I'm just grateful that this happened. I really, and it's taken me two days to get here. <laughs> um, and I also wanna say uh, with regard to the public comment um, that was all genuine and uh, very unique, and I loved it. I just want to um, make a comment on the uh, elected officials that chose to use their time to take pot shots at our staff. Um, it was unfair and unprofessional. And as uh, Commissioner May had mentioned before, 
uh, our staff is clearly above bar with everything that we do. So I just wanted to say that out loud, like chin up, we're all in this boat together, doing whatever's, wherever it's going. And that was just so unfair. And I just want to put that out there. Thank you. Thank you, Gateway. Thank you to the folks that showed up. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. And I know it was um, unusual to meet uh, in this part of the state in this time of year. So thank you for those adjustments. And sometimes weird silver linings happen. So um, thank you for that. And thank you for all of us that travel. Depending on what corner of the state it is, it's hard, it is far for everyone. <laughs> so, um, But thank you. It's, it's certainly well noted. And we will certainly shift back to, to the Eastern Plains. And some of the ones coming up hopefully are a little bit more central. Commissioner Haskett, would you like to ask, bring us home? Commissioner Haskett. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I can echo what um, Commissioner Bluck has said. It was nice to hear from the people who um, live and work with what a lot of the wildlife size does. So um, I have one administrative comment. So um, uh, Commissioner Bailey mentioned about the videos. Would it be possible that we could put those videos in a separate packet or something on our iPads. Even me who is used to it, I struggle to find them every time. I looked this morning and I couldn't find them again. <laughs> and I, I, I found them and I haven't found them, but it's really hard to find those videos. And um, <laughs> if we could get a little help there, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, it was a lot of, lot of information this time. Sorry, go, go ahead, Brian. Yeah. Yeah, Brian Dreher, Terrestrial Section Manager. I, uh, we're gonna shift stuff up a little bit, actually, as we go forward. And so if we do videos again, we're gonna make them accessible, comment well heard. But what I will say is, I, and I mentioned yesterday, we're, we're gonna to move to a little bit of a different approach with our herd management plans. And we're just out of efficiency, trying to get these done, get objectives updated. And, and when we go in, I believe it's one of the uh, January meetings in Gunnison, uh, the date escapes me, we're gonna actually do some live live presentations of those uh, herd management plans, because it's actually gonna be 17 plans all at the same time, many of which are gonna be continuations of plans that you guys have already approved, right? And, but there will be some new ones in there, and we're trying to strategize how to be effective with that time. Um, but these will be pretty lengthy documents. When you look at seven, the, each individual herd management plan is only about five to six pages, but when you put 17 together, it's a pretty lengthy document, and that's really the numbers that we're dealing with. And so we're still trying to figure out what that will look like. If we bring back recorded presentations, we'll make them very available and uh, make sure you're, you're aware of where they're at. So, um, Those are done far ahead of the commission meeting to a degree, but would it also be possible to we get those earlier than a week or two ahead of time? Could we get them a month ahead of time? If it's 117 pages and... We have a video or whatnot. It would be nice to be able to have a little more time to go through that stuff. Yeah, and, and we'll do our best to do that. That's a great question and great comment. We've heard the comment before, and in this instance, because of the length of those plans, we'll do our best to, to make sure that they're available um, ahead of time uh, so, that, so that you have a good chance to look at them. Okay, thank you. Okay, Commissioner Adams. Thank you. Um, so I actually just had an update to... Um, the community dialogue at Stenko um, Ranch. Some of the folks from the Southwest Colorado Wolf Collaborative were there, and they let me know that they were working on a website with additional information about wolves, et cetera. And I just got the email this morning that the website is now live. And so it is the South SW Colorado Wolf Co op dot squarespace.com, but if you just look up the Southwest Colorado West Wolf Coalition, I'll also include this in something, but um, just for those who are, are listening, um, that this resource is available. It includes resources about state, state agency documents and laws, CSU Center for Human Carnivore Coexistence information sheets. Um, there's a whole section on indigenous practices and indigenous views related to this, um, as well as additional books and materials that you can have. So it's just always helpful to have um, additional resources and information. Um, and I was also informed of a class in North Glen that it's a STEM lab school, uh, and they are actually using the wolf reintroduction as a way to teach conflict resolution, a second grade class. 
and they had to do a uh, presentations on what they think should happen um, as it relates to some of the wolf introduction. And again, I don't know what the curriculum is in the scope, but just the idea that the concepts and conversations that we're having right now, young people are using to help them understand what does teamwork look like? What is um, different values and different perspectives look like? What, are, what does compromise look like without losing one's integrity? And so it was just really exciting to know that the conversations that we're having here are already, I mean, when we talk about real world examples and opportunities in the classroom, this is exactly what we're talking about. So um, I wanna thank the STEM lab school for um, taking this information. And again, not only are students then more aware of it, but their families are as well. So again, just wanted to lift up um, the connections that we do policy-wise with our educational folks and thank the folks at the Southwest Colorado Wolf Cooperative for continuing um, to walk in step with us as we move towards our shared goals. Thank you so much. Oh, and then I also just wanted to make a comment, although I look forward to the day when I can look out into a room and see a whole bunch of people that look like me. Um, I'm excited for the, well, we always get snowed out in the front range. So we, our, our meetings are January and March. Every year I've been here, it gets snowed out. So I look for, and we don't have a community meeting. So I look forward to resolving those uh, in 2023. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner Adams. Um, and maybe that's the perfect way to conclude. Um, so we do have our virtual online um, opportunity December 9th. I think we heard enough about that yesterday, but Reed, if there's any need to say anything more about what to expect on that, unless there's questions. Okay, um, I don't see any. And yes, and we're at 1021 and I'm gonna end at 1025. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding got a record to keep up here. <laughs> um, okay, so expect that and we'll get more information um, as that um, gets a little bit closer. Um, and then we're in Colorado Springs. Uh, I think the team is um, finalizing our arrangements for Colorado Springs. That is a call it two and a half day meeting by the time we travel and all that. Um, it is just, just note that it is Martin Luther King holiday that Monday. So we've asked this, that, that start with time for travel on Tuesday. Does that sound right? Thank you. Just want to make sure I'm kind of going on the fly and remembering all this. So you'll be able to travel hopefully on um, Tuesday to Colorado Springs and we'll go through Thursday the 19th. Um, more information to come on that. And then we turn around the week, a week later and are in Gunnison on January 25th. Um, if there is a massive bomb cyclone or storm, um, the team will, um, because I said it, there won't be. Um, if there is a big storm or there's um, a, a system coming in, we're going to make that call with a couple of days advance and not have you wondering the day before. So um, just know that. Um, and thank you very much to the team for adding some of those. And w just given facilities in places like Walden and some of these other places, just expect that we might be a little bit creative in our setup um, and how we do that. As long as we have the technology and the space, um, we may not be sitting in this kind of hollow you or whatever. We'll just um, try to punt a little bit and make sure that we're listening. A lot of those are really for the purposes of the public and public engagement. So um, I trust everyone here is flexible enough to accommodate those tweaks. Anything else for the go of the order? Acting Director Dugan, anything else? I would just like to thank everyone for a tremendously productive meeting. Um, I have been to a lot of these meetings and I really appreciate the decisions that were made and it really helps us to move forward in a lot of uh, areas. So thank you, commissioners. Okay, happy Thanksgiving. It is 1023, we're adjourned. <laughs>